Do you think it's tricky when you're, you're dealing with uh, these kind of movies where you know, formula can be a good thing. You feel comfortable when you go to the movies and you're getting what you expected to get and it's put through its paces with originality or flair. But is it a, is it a tricky line to walk in terms of being, you don't want to be derivative, you want to be original, but there is a formula that, that's at play that you want to kind of hit those milestones or those beats. Is that tricky? Yeah, it is tricky. I mean, I think it's the trickiest part, but the truth is, I think that a lot of people who write screenplays and a lot of people who you know work in our industry um, condescend to rules and structure. They see it as um, conventions that simply make the movie conventional and simply make it palatable for an right. audience as opposed to things that can actually help a movie. I mean, I look at something like, this is a little pretentious, but like, if you look at a sonnet form, a sonnet is so much more structurally rigorous than a screenplay is. It's got fucking, the rhyme is the same, the meter is the same, right. it ends with a rhyming couplet. Like, how you could make that seem original right. and propulsive is a lot more challenging than how you make page 30, page 60, page 90 feel surprising even though. So, I mean, you know, I, I think that structure is incredibly important to scripts. And I think there's something kind of interesting about the three-act structure in movies because I do think that it conforms to the way that we watch television because mm -hmm. it's a 30-minute show, a 60-minute show, a 30-minute show. And I think that, you know, the acts conform to those roughly that well, that's interesting. Frame. Do you feel like you kind of absorb that through osmosis over growing up and stuff? I do. I think that kids especially now, I think that it's a, it's a comfortable structural model because we know how to watch 30 and 60 minute um, you know, sequences. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I think the challenge of being a genre writer is that you, have, you do have to service those conventions, but right. you also have to turn it on its ear and make it different. Mm -hmm. And I think the way you turn it on its ear and make it different is not by fudging where the first and second act's gonna end, but more, um, adding a certain texture, a certain density of character. Subverting from the beginning too, probably. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, and, 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 and crossing genres. I mean, working on X-Men 3 was a really interesting experience for me because that is an incredibly character-driven yeah. franchise. And you know, if you watch the first two movies, the first one especially, and you'll see in the third, there are a lot of sit-down, grown-up dialogue yeah. scenes. And it's the pain of being an outsider. Absolutely, and, it, it, and there's something, so, you're right, there's something so emotionally pure at the core of those movies, and they inform, that informs every scene of the film. Um, and when I was writing that, and when we were shooting it, any scene that wasn't about what it feels like to be persecuted, what it feels like to feel different, to question your identity, um, was jettisoned. Wow. We just lost that scene. And it's true in the action sequences too. If you watch the action, all of those, the action sequences in X3, and there's a lot of them and they're big, are the core conflict of the action um, is about identity. Mm. Is about one person wanting to be one thing, another person wanting to be something else, or wanting themselves to be something else, and how they collide. Right. Um, and you know there were sequences that didn't have that, and those are the sequences that, believe it or not, we had to trim the budget on that. Um, right. You know that got trimmed right. or cut. Does Brett Ratner feel like an outsider at this point? <laughs> like, is there anything about him that he does out? actually? And this and is you the know Brett. This is the director of Rush Hour and yes, and, and a friend of yours and, and, and mine as well. Looks now. very inside. <laughs> he is very inside, but you know what? Right. Like, but he I fought his way through up to, the, to through the industry as an outsider. He fought his way in as an outsider, and I think that. There is a part of Brett, not to psychoanalyze Brett, but I think there's a part of Brett that's a little bit of a tourist in that life. Mm -hmm. um, I think as much as he's inside the, right. you know, the Hollywood machine, yeah. um, I think he's also watching it as much as he's the epicenter of it. Interesting. And I think that, you know, look, I, I think what's true about a lot of people who work in our industry, maybe more men than women, but maybe women too, I don't know, um, is we're basically just the guys that didn't get the girls in high school. Mm -hmm. And you know, like we felt ostracized, we felt, awkward, we were too brainy, whatever the problem was, we didn't play sports, whatever. Right. Um, Brett was that guy in high school, right. you know? I mean, and you know, he's not six foot two, he's not like svelte, like, you know, <laughs> he was when he was younger, but right. nevertheless, like, you carry that with you, sure. no matter how famous you get, no matter sure. how successful you get. And so I think that there's an element of him, as there is with all of us, um, that still knows what it feels like to be an outsider. Now, you've collaborated uh, with Akiva Goldsman, uh, on m most notably Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with uh, a success another successful writer, and uh, how was that collaboration? Akiva you know, has risen to the, to the ranks of, of, of the top three in town because yeah. of his screenplays for A Beautiful Mind, and, and now the upcoming Da Vinci Code. What was that collaboration like? It was amazing. I mean, it was amazing on a lot of levels. It was amazing, one, because obviously the fear of working with a, a writer of Akiva's, um, not just uh, creative strength, but political, power right. is that you'll 
get subsumed or you'll get replaced or he will come on and rewrite you. Did you guys meet on Mr. and Mrs. Smith? Had yes, you know? we did. That's, okay. We met, I met with the woman who, um, this woman, Verena Blyle, who ran his company on, on my first script and when I came up with the idea for Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I felt like he was the right producer for it and he immediately understood it. And he was really the champion of the movie from the beginning to the end. I mean, we pitched it to every studio in town and every studio passed. Which is how you ended up at New Regency, which is a satellite production company? We, actually, we didn't even end up at New Regency. New Regency passed initially too. How we ended up at New Regency was the one place that, that paid me to write it, less than Writers Guild minimum, right. was um, Summit, which is uh, primarily a um, foreign sales company, right. um, Patrick Waksberger's company. And then when I wrote the first draft, they liked it, and it was a bigger movie than they could actually bankroll themselves. Oh, and that's when Regency became involved because of Patrick's relationship to Arnon Milton. Okay. So you guys, your passion for the idea took you outside the system. Yeah. You, you got the script financed and then went back into the system. But exactly. You, but but the, the, the passion was there to get it written no matter what. Yeah, and, and to answer the question about Akiva, among other things, there were plenty of times, like I was in my second year of film school. I was like 26 years old or something, and I was terrified of going into all those pitches. And when, you know, you're a kid and... 15 to 20 grown-ups in suits tell you you're wrong, you start to believe in that you're wrong. Right. And the one person that was telling me you're right was Akiva. And if it were not for Akiva, and trusting that this man who's made a lot of movies and had a lot of successful movies may be more right than these other people, I think I probably would have given up at some point. Wow. Um, and I didn't, and I wrote it, and Akiva got it very quickly to Nicole, and then it really took on a, a different life. But the thing that Akiva's brilliant at as a producer is, it's sort of a, we've talked about it a bit, he and I, is. You feel Akiva's hand on your shoulder, but you never feel his hand on your hand. Mm. You know, you never feel like he's forcing you to write what he wants. You never feel as though he's becoming the writer. Right. It's more like a spirit guide. Yeah, mm. it is. And the thing that's wonderful about him as a teacher is he's so um, brilliant, not only as a screenwriter, but as a professional writer, because there is a difference between the craft of writing and the business of being a screenwriter. And he is, I think, Unquestionably, he is the greatest professional writer in the sense of having mastered the system right. of anybody who's out there. And the other thing that he was great at, because we've become you know close and friends, is he's he he's someone that you want to turn to when you don't exactly know how to balance your professional life with your personal life. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I think is a challenge for all of us who work in this industry is it's it's a very consuming industry. Yes. It's a full time job. Um, it becomes a part of your social fabric as well, and you do need some separation. Does that happen a lot where successful or established screenwriters will help fledgling ones or, or, or mentor new, newer ones? And do you think that happens a lot or is that, did you have an uncommon experience? Um, I'd like to think I had an uncommon experience because it was so close right. and because ultimately it was, it, was, you know, it, was, it was really nice for both of us. But um, I do think it is common that you know, people who have done this for a little while want to help others because they had their mentor when right. they were you know, my age. Are there, are there other writers that you, uh, contemporary writers that, whose work you admire? Oh yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm really like a screenplay geek. You right. know, like I read a lot of screenplays that are not the hot spec or the right. script I'm getting sent to rewrite. Like just, you know, every time Scott Frank writes a script, every time he writes a draft of a script, I want to read that script. Right. You know, every time Steven Zellian writes a script, I want to read that script, um, knowing that, you know, it's not, going to tell me anything about the marketplace right. and knowing that I'm never going to rewrite it, right. thank it's God. The joy of reading good writing. Yeah. And, you know, those screenwriters who have really mastered the craft, and, you know, another writer who I really love, I, I, he was some of the first screenplays I've ever read that I, they really were sort of influential and inspiring to me was Shane Black. Mm -hmm. Shane Black's first script, the first Lethal Weapon movie, and actually the script to Long Kiss Goodnight. Yeah. I think are spectacular screenplays and really yeah. very character driven. I mean, yeah. especially the first Lethal Weapon movie is like, it is a screwball comedy. Yeah. It's all dialogue. I mean, even the action is like, yeah. you know, very rare. Yeah. Now he, he in, the, in, the, in the descriptive passage, passages would make it a pleasurable read for any reader, mm -hmm. which, which he would kind of be, became famous for. Yeah, and I mean, I remember, I remember a passage in, um, I mean, I call it a passage, like it's a novel. Like I remember like <laughs> a, 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 you yeah. know, a, a line in, a, in Long Kiss Goodnight script, which by the way is like, you know, as you know, I mean, you, were, you guys made that movie, right? right. Um, there's, a pa there's a moment where he describes two burning cars and he says, imagine God playing dice in Mont craps in Monte Carlo. Now imagine those dice are burning cars. Right. And you're like, there's no reason to have you're done there. that whole yeah. thing. You just get it, you yeah. get it. And like, you get the tone of that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something sort of uh, subversive even about like invoking God in the middle of an action sure. sequence that's just right. Um, so, you know, I read the sort of the masters who win the Academy right. Awards, and I also read the guys who write in my genre. How many uh, scripts did you write before the first one got produced? Did you, did you write many uh, screenplays? Um, Have you written many screenplays? No. I mean, I met many relative to, you know, a lot of other writers, no. I mean, I've been very lucky in that things I've written have gotten produced. I've probably written eight or nine 
different projects in general, mm -hmm. um, inc including things that I really rewrote over a span of time, like Fantastic Four I rewrote over months and months, so I'd count that as a script. Um, but the first script I wrote was Ghouls of New York, which sold and never got made. Right. Um, and the second feature script I wrote was Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So, oh, that's not true, actually. I wrote the project, the, the horror film, and then I wrote Mr. and Mrs. Smith as my thesis project in, in film school. Okay. And, but that was a process where, you know, I wrote the first draft of that, and four years later, it was in the mm -hmm. movie theater. It wasn't like two years later. Right. It was the hundreds of drafts. Was there a big change from the thesis project script to the final draft? Um, to me, there was, mm -hmm. because I was inside it, obviously, right. so like every nuance becomes big, um, magnified. But I don't think there was. I think fundamentally it was the same story. I think the characters were the same characters, and I think the conflict was the same conflict. A lot of the scenes were the same scenes, those marriage therapy scenes, the scene right. in the kitchen, in the uh, in the dining room. Like A lot of the focal scenes right. were the same focal scenes, but um, how we got there and the twists and turns and shaving down the story and bringing up the characters, that all really evolved. Not only over the span of development, I, I think actually the script evolved more in production okay. than it did in the three years that preceded <laughs> production. That's pretty wild. Yeah, it was pretty wild. And it was a wild and loose way to work. Right. And I, I love it. I mean, I'm working with Doug on his next movie, and mm -hmm. I have to say there is something kind of addictive about it because you're constantly bumping into happy surprises. And right. the thing that's great about Doug is when actors make mistakes in scenes, I know that a lot of directors do this, mm -hmm. those are the moments you know we're going to be in the movie. Right. Like if you watch the movie, there's so many little moments and little scenes that have become my favorite scenes right. in the film. Like there's a moment where Brad's in his office for the first time and he rolls in a chair toward um, the screen where his boss is gonna give him the information and he's left the coffee cup on the desk and he rolls back and grabs the coffee cup and, and there's, any other director would cut that out because it's a flub and it's not doing anything right. for the movie. But it brings spontaneity to the to It the does, film. and it makes him human. Right. Um, so yeah, no, it's, that evolved a lot. What's been your most rewarding experience as a screenwriter? Um, I would have to say it's probably, a tie between Mr. and Mrs. Smith and X-Men 3. Okay. I mean, um, you know, very different processes. Right. One in that, um, you know, one was an original and one was an adaptation mm -hmm. of, and a sequel. But um, they, were, they were rewarding because I felt like I was given a very privileged place of authorship. Right. I was given a place where I was sitting side by side with the director when we were making the movie. I mean, Brett, like Doug, he's a very different person than Doug right. in his persona, but he is very similar in that he's very inclusive, he's collaborative, he's not territorial about the set at all, mm -hmm. he wants the writer there, he wants the writer there in conversations with the actors. Right. Um, so it was a great, both of those processes, different as they were, were great in that I felt like I learned a lot about movie making. Did you feel a lot of pressure with X-Men just because it's a huge uh, franchise and you're, you're prepping or shooting without a locked script and, and they yeah. come to you and go, help us? Yeah, well, I mean, X-Men was, uh, there was so many different forms of pressure on that movie. One form of pressure is, I grew up loving the X-Men comics. I know that there are religious fans out there. I mean, right. religious, like, they'll come to your house and kill your children, religious. <laughs> right. You know, so that's a form of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're, like, adapting the Bible, that's a pretty sure. serious thing. Um, another form of pressure is it's a huge franchise, obviously. The second movie was better than the first and more successful than the first, so you want the third to be not Godfather 3. Right. Um, and, or Superman 3. Right, you want it to be Return of the King or something. Yeah, you do. Right. Return of the King or Revenge of the Sith. Right. Um, and... You're stretching it with Sith, but I'll let you have it. Oh, come on. <laughs> compared to the first two prequels? True. Okay, dude, no, I hear you. I mean, uh, compared to the first two prequels, not compared to Empire. <laughs> okay. But, um, I would even take in Re Return of the Jedi on X3. Like, I just, I just didn't want you it to be Ewoks like... You would take Ewoks over... I would take Ewoks okay. over, you know, like... Attack they, of the Clones? Attack of the... Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. um, uh, and the last pressure was the professional one, which is, yeah, like, there wasn't a script when I was hired. Wow. Brian Singer left X-Men 3 to do Superman. Mm -hmm. They had not started the script yet. They called me in... Uh, October of um, 2004 and said, we start shooting in six months. There's no script. Right. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to have to write one quickly. Right. Um, so it was a, the progress to production of that movie was wild. And, and they're it's a building huge stuff movie. and they're building sets and costumes are being made. Costumes are being made. And you're they're writing. building sets. Mm -hmm. I'm writing. Um, you know, the, the, what helps in that particular case is some of the costumes are existing, some of the sets are right. standing, and the school you, is the school. Did they give you a roadmap of like, hey, we need a story to basically do these kind of moves? They were actually pretty open in terms of, I mean, we all knew it was gonna be the Dark Phoenix story right. because that was set up in, in X2 by Brian and right. also because that's the best of the, of the comic runs in X-Men yeah. history. Um, but there was something that we sort of discovered as we were in the, I was in the first stages of writing the first draft, which is there's a great um, comic run by Joss Whedon actually in mm -hmm. the new um, X-Men comics um, that's all about a mutant right. cure. And Josh Whedon being the creator of Buffy. Of Buffy right. and, and, you know, a great comic. Right. Uh, enthusiast. Uh, enthusiast and writer now. Mm -hmm. um, and Josh had this, created this great idea in one of his runs called Gifted that was about a cure for mutancy. And 
just seemed so rich and interesting politically, right. you know? Um, and in terms of playing on the identity politics of the mm -hmm. movie, it was such a clear, easy metaphor and way in. So, you know, that was one where, yeah, I was writing pages as they were building right. whatever was on the page. Um, and, you know, Brett, to his credit, came onto the movie. We had a different director before Brett who ended up falling off the movie. Right. Matthew Vaughn from Matt Vaughn, Layer Cake, who did right. Layer Cake mm -hmm. and, and, and left the movie for personal reasons. And Brett came onto the movie six weeks before we started shooting. Right. I mean, this is a $200 million movie. Yeah, Brett's That's, probably the only guy who can do that. Yeah, no, it's true, and, 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 and you know Brett, and this is one of the reasons why actually making the movie was so pleasant, despite the pressure, yeah. is his enthusiasm, his energy. It trickles. It's through. crazy, it's so infectious, it's totally boundless. It's insane to me that it's real. Like, yeah. the first week or so, I was like, oh, he's gonna crash. Like, he's just, he's manic, and he's gonna hit some depressive curve at right. some point. And, maybe at age 60, but yeah, not Yeah, maybe, <laughs> but not now. I mean, probably it's, not, yeah. It's endless, and it's right. like, he doesn't sleep, and he just shows up, and he's ready to go, right. and um, it's very impressive. <laughs> and that kept me going through, you know, our last month of shooting, we, I lived up in Vancouver for that movie, right. and the last month of shooting was in the rain at night for a month. Oh my God. And it was, yeah, and it was long nights because we had to wrap the movie. Sure. So, um, you know, without Brett's enthusiasm, I, there would have been like mass suicide right. on the movie. What's the best thing you've ever written, and according to you, either produced or unproduced? I guess I would say Mr. and Mrs. Smith I'm proudest of. Okay. Um, I don't know that the final draft of the movie is the draft that I'm most proud of. Right. There's a draft somewhere in between the first and the last draft right. um, that I'm really proud of because I feel like it was a very specific tone. I'm always most proud of being able to achieve tone right. in scripts because I think that's the hardest. I think telling a good story is difficult. Right. Has that been, what's, what's been historically the biggest challenge for you in your writing? Has it been establishment of tone? That's the hardest thing for me. Um, I think it's the biggest challenge and I think it's when you, when you nail it um, it's a great feeling. And, and you know, I've been on movies, Fantastic Four is an example of a movie that I came on about two months before they started shooting, and it had the basic story structure intact, and obviously the characters were gonna be the four characters, right. and the fifth villain, um, but the tone wasn't there. And I don't think I ever, to Tim's story, the director's right. credit, I don't think I ever nailed the tone. I think the movie has a, an, a sort of a vague tone to it, and a yeah. tone that was, I think, sort of reverse engineered in yeah. post-production. Almost a family film, almost. It kind of became a very it light became tone. That. Yeah. It became that, and the, and the intention of, in going into the movie was, making a little bit more like Spider-Man, having it be a little bit more of like a teenager's movie, a young right. teenage movie, but a little more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And when we watched it, we realized it, it, the thing that would best service the film would be to actually lean it toward a family movie, which, which did, commercially it was very successful. But you know, that was an example of just, I couldn't ever find the tone. Right, at what point is that decision made about, we're gonna gear it now towards families or make it lighter? That was in post. Okay. There were reshoots that we did for a couple of weeks to actually huh. fill in and keep pushing in that direction. But I, but I think, what you discover, as I'm sure you know, is like when you make discoveries in post, they were there all along. Right. You know, and, and that tone was there from the first day we started shooting. We just right. didn't know it. Right. Um, and it's hard to tell. In, I mean, in hindsight, you know that, but when yeah. you're in the middle of it, I imagine it's a different story. Yeah, and I, think, and I think tone, again, is a really difficult thing to gauge when you're making the movie because, you know, you make movies in these tiny little piecemeal ways. It's right. half a scene and one shot from right. that. Out of order and like not, yeah. not in chronological order. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, on, on, on Fantastic Four, it was something that we really discovered as we went. Yeah. X-Men was, I, I, I'm very proud of the script of that, but I think it was a much easier script to write because Brian had established such a clear tone. Right. And I think it was an easier movie for Brett to step into right. because he didn't have to create the voice of the movie. Do you outline uh, yeah. in the beginning? What's Obsessively. Your, what's your process in the, is it beats or is it full-blown treatment or what happens? Full-blown treatment. Um, I, I'm pretty obsessive about outlining. Right. I, I tend, like, I think the more insecure you are as a writer, the more you need to outline right. to make yourself feel secure about the process. And, so what I do is I do really like, you know, 40, 50 page outlines, oh, wow. um, especially to originals, not right. to rewrites, but when I'm starting from scratch. And, and then, is that for your own use or do you share that with- That's for my own use. Okay. I, show, I, you know, I shared the Mr. Mr. Smith one with Akiva because okay. I felt like he, he was such a collaborator. Right, but um, not the studio or anything. Not the studio. Right. Because it would just scare them and like yeah. giving the studio like 40 pages of prose to read is like, <laughs> right. they're gonna get a cover, they're not yeah, gonna read it anyway. Yeah, I think the last time someone did that was when Faulkner was writing for the studio. Right, so. right, that's probably right. Okay. That makes sense. So no, I don't show that to anyone other than if I feel like there's a really close collaborator, right. I will, or, or I just keep it for myself. And as I'm going, I'm constantly out, every day I outline the scene. Right. So every day I, I'll do like a, a sort of a beat sheet of the scene where I know each beat of the scene and what each character wants in those beats mm -hmm. before I commit it to final draft software right. writing. And how important is discipline to your process? Do you set specific goals and kind of you strive to stick for them? I, I, think, um, I think discipline is the most important muscle for a writer. Um, there's a great, a uh, quote by Virginia Woolf in one of her diaries where she says, writing is all habit. 
Right. And I do think it's habit. I mean, I think it's the same way that like we get hungry at noon because we just that we've learned that's when lunch is. You know, you get tired at 10, 11, whatever time you go to sleep because it's like your circadian rhythm. I think that you do have to get into a certain rhythm, a habit, writing wise, to convince your body to do it every day. Right. Um, and discipline for me is not hard because I tend to be a little OCD. So like right. discipline is like a sickness for Are me. Are you easily distracted? Uh, yeah, but. Not when you're working. Not when I'm working, yeah. I mean, I think actually once I'm in it, I'm really in it. And actually the problem is that I'm not distracted. Like right. in a way that, you know, I, I should probably leave my work more and go in the house and hang out with my little baby boy. Right. Um, but I get deep into it. Um, so I do think, I think discipline is incredibly important. Um, is there, has the, have there been pitch meetings before you get to this outline stage in, in your career? Do you find that you pitch a lot? And is that a, how do you feel about that process? I think you're always pitching as a writer. Um, the hardest part of pitching is obviously when you're pitching an original that you want somebody to buy and pay you to write. Right. Because that's just terrifying. And it's just right. Is totally, that easier for you now than that you have a body of work? Uh, it's probably easier to sell now than right. it was before, but the actual process is no easier to me. I mean, right. I find it incredibly daunting and it's also such an unnatural way to tell a story. Right. How do you prepare for it? I over-prepare. Over um, I write these incredibly detailed outlines. I essentially almost write the pitch mm -hmm. and rehearse it like, you know, a hundred times so that I can actually put the outline away. Right. And, you know, a little bit to me, preparation is about creating a space in which you can improvise. Mm -hmm. It's not about preparation so that you write exactly what you prepared. Right. Um, so I, in pitching, it's the same as in writing. If I know the scene inside and out, I can start to riff when I'm writing it. If I know the pitch inside and out, I can start to riff in the room when I feel like they're leaning more toward the comedy moments or right. the more dramatic moments. I can start to ch shift a little bit if I know it really right. inside and out. On the big movies, I, I imagine you get a lot of notes. Are you, how do you deal with kind of incorporating you know, Marvel's notes and Fox's notes and, you know, whomever's notes. It's hard. I mean, it's, it's I think, one in process, one of the most challenging things for a Hollywood writer when you're working in production, especially, or toward production, is negotiating all those notes and knowing what is, what you should compromise, what's, like, literally um, sacred, and no matter what, they will fire you before you'll compromise that right. thing, um, and what's in between the two. Uh, so, for, you know, on an X-Men movie, for instance, you have Marvel's notes, you have uh, 20th Century Fox's notes, you have the other producer's notes, other established producers like Lauren Schiller-Don who's produced a lot of movies. Then you have the 12 to 15 members of the cast right. who have notes, you know? Um, and you have to really be malleable enough to say that's a good idea, let me think about it, and right. genuinely think about it and take it aboard and if it's a good idea, execute it. Right. But also strong enough to say I tried it and it doesn't work. Right. And I think part of the trick of being a good screener, and this is something I really learned from Akiva, is, um, well, there's two things, I think. One is knowing how to hear a note and know that the note is not the thing a lot of the time. That sometimes somebody says, this isn't working, um, not because that thing isn't working, but because there's something underneath it or because there's something that was in the setup to that. Like I say, about the third act sometimes not working means the first act isn't, the setup's not enough in the first right. act. That's something I learned from Akiva. You have to actually interpret notes the same way you would interpret reading a novel. Right. Um, and the other part of it is, and this is more strategic, you have to learn how to make your ideas somebody else's. You have to learn how to convince people that the idea that you want to arrive at was their idea. Go oh, the Jedi mind trick. The Jedi mind <laughs> trick is the most important part, right. I think, of especially being on set. And the way to do that is very simple. Is like you just talk around the idea right. until they get to it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like when you're like, you, you know, uh, uh, it's a little bit like you're painting by numbers and you're leaving one square unpainted. Right. I'll remember the, that the next time we meet. Yeah, no, you, <laughs> well, <laughs> please don't. Cool. Um, but yeah, no, I think that that's, I, I do think learning how to digest notes right. is. What's next for you? What's uh, coming up? Um, a couple things, actually. Uh, I tend to work on you know two, three things at the same time, partly because I like the balance of that. Okay. Pops me in and out of things. I can't write two first drafts at the same time, but um, we're doing a Mr. Miss Smith TV show oh. um, for ABC that Doug is going to direct. Now, why TV show and not sequel feature? Um, a couple reasons. One is I think creatively the arc of the movie is sort of done. I think the fun right. of the first movie was them falling in love, and it's hard to mimic that. Right. The weakest of the three acts of the film is the third act, and the third act would be what the sequel is, them okay. being partners. Mm -hmm. So our feeling was, why not um, sort of take that and put it in a form that probably bet better serves that story, which is TV, where the week to week is, they're on a new case, they're struggling in their marriage, and now struggling really to be partners. Now it really is the thin man, yeah. kind of a little bit. Exactly. Okay. And I think the spark of, this, of the movie was that falling in love story. Um, and you, it's hard to do a sequel to a love story. Sure. Um, the professional is hard to get Brad and Angie to do a sequel. Gotcha. Um, not for monetary reasons, although that would be, I'm sure, very complicated. A lot of artists don't want to go backwards and repeat themselves. Exactly. And, and I think for them also, and, and this is my own sub supposition, I, I don't know any way of knowing this, I would imagine, you know, they're trying to live their life right now. And like already they have a billion people 
trying to chase them down. When we were shooting the movie, toward the end, we had like you know helicopters circling above us wow. with paparazzi hanging out the side. It looked like they were going to shoot people. Right. Um, so I'm not sure they'd want to jump back into that again. So that that was the impetus for it. And Doug's had some success in television, right. and I'm interested in TV okay. too. So it felt like the right place for it. Um, so I'm doing that, and I'm working with Doug on his new feature, a movie called Jumper, that we start shooting in about a month and a half. Okay. That I'm actually producing, like Akiva, producing and uh, and rewriting. Great. Um, we start shooting in a month and a half, and uh, that project I mentioned before with Nicole. I'll start writing that once Jumper starts going into production. Um, so that should keep me busy for the summer. Good luck with everything, man. Thanks, Mike. Well, we want to we want to thank today's subject, Simon Kimberg, for being with us. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Mike. That was very fun. Yeah, me we want to thank you for watching as well. Please remember to check out our other great interviews in this series with industry pros. And remember, it all starts with you. The next written by credit could be yours. I'm Mike DeLuca.